last lecture, we talked about the Sankhya system's very complex analysis of the human personality. You might compare it almost to the kind of breakdown of the human body we get in a text like Gray's Anatomy. In a sense, what Sankhya provides is a kind of anatomy, if you will, of the personality. And the personality comes about because of the two principles that um, Sankhya claims are both real, nature and the conscious mind. And the difficulty is that we have a personality because the two are, in some sense, confused with each other. But the truth is that they really don't have anything to do with each other, and what we need to do in order to fulfill ourselves is recognize that fact. Now, all this, in a way, strikes many people as rather strange. Um, and I think this strangeness is not just a function of how complicated the scheme is, but also the idea that you've got two things that seem to be bound up together, but the truth is they're not. Those who question the Sankhya system ask, well, how is it that we had this natural illusion that we actually are part of nature in the first place? If the truth is that conscious mind is one thing, nature is something else, and the two are really separate and distinct, why is it that everyone ends up or starts out with the illusion that we actually are part of nature and that nature affects us? So this goal of the Sankhya system to disidentify seems like a kind of odd problem, a problem that doesn't seem to go away just by defining them as two separate kind of things. A further problem is that in talking about how to go about disidentifying our own consciousness from nature, um, it seems that the Sankhya system isn't all that consistent. Because after all, it claims that the sattva guna, um, the one that has to do with clarity and intelligence, is best able to manifest our true nature. It's a, a fairly transparent guna, you might say. But again, sattva is supposed to be part of nature. How does it have this function that it can manage to transparently uh, allow Purusha to appear if they really have nothing to do with each other? In a way, we've got a problem similar to the kind that um, dualisms in the West face of figuring out how the two component things go together. But in this case, because there is the idea of unhooking things, um, uh, making things go apart that never were together in the first place, it's conceptually even harder to see how the Sankhya system is ultimately supposed to work. An opponent view uh, takes the view that, in fact, there is only one thing. And indeed, we've already discussed how Brahmanism believes this, that there is only Brahman. Now, there are various interpretations of Brahmanism, and in this lecture, I'm mostly going to concentrate on one, which analyzes some of the difficulties that come about for this view. Certainly, the Brahmanic view doesn't have the problem that we've got two kinds of things that either go together or don't. There's only one thing. But that raises certain questions as to how, how the world that, we, that appears to us is related to it, since after all, what we see seems to involve more than one thing. The school of thought I'm going to talk about is called Advaita Vedanta. Vedanta, as I've mentioned before, is a term for the Upanishads, the last part of the Vedas. Uh, but at the same time, those schools of thought that focus a lot of attention on that text are also sometimes called Vedanta, or Vedantic schools. And this one, Advaita Vedanta, is such a school. It uses the uh, authority of the Upanishads to theorize about the nature of Brahman. Advaita is a term meaning non-dual. In other words, there's no duality within Brahman. This is already a concept that we discussed earlier. But this non-duality is hard to understand, precisely because, as I've also, I think, suggested, there are, there's really no differentiation that we can give to characterize what Brahman is. One of the major proponents of the Advaita system is a theorist named Shankara, who lived in the 8th century CE. Um, and his elaboration of how to make sense of some of Advaita's thoughts about the nature of Brahman um, has become pretty definitive for this particular school of thought. Advaita Vedanta can be classified as a kind of spiritual monism. Monism is, um, in a sense, like dualism, except we have one thing as opposed to two. Um, the one thing that exists according to Brahmanism generally, and Advaita Vedanta in particular, is Brahman. It's a spiritual entity. So everything that appears to us other than Brahman is an illusion of some sort or another. 
For this reason, Advaita Vedanta is sometimes called an illusionist school because it's claiming that the world that we see around us is really illusory in some sense. And of course, what we need to articulate is exactly what sense that is. This is a very different position from Sankhya, not only in being monistic, but also in being illusionistic. You might recall that in the Sankhya system, even though there's Purusha on the one hand and Prakriti on the other, and the two are not the same thing and shouldn't be confused, they're still both considered to be real. In the Vedantic systems, the idea is that, um, or at least this form of Vedanta, um, the idea is that the world that we see around us that seems to have a lot of distinctions within it is ultimately a, an illusion and reality is something else, Brahman. The emphasis of Advaita Vedanta is the claim made in the Upanishads that all is Brahman. In fact, there are a number of passages in the Upanishads that suggest that all is Brahman and that Atman is Brahman, that the self is Atman and the self therefore is ultimately Brahman. These are all equations we discussed earlier. But how exactly do we understand what seems to be distinct from Brahman? Well, ultimately, this is going to be unreal. But that includes really everything that we know for the most part. Um, we think we know our individual selves, but the individual self on this way of looking at things is as unreal as anything else that appears in the external world. And the goal spiritually is to recognize the unity of ourselves with everyone and everything else and the fundamental reality of all those things being Brahman. Now how do we do this? Well, what we have to do is somehow have a direct personal experience. What we can't do is develop a merely theoretical knowledge of this. To make a comparison, you might consider how good of a driver you would expect someone who had read a book about driving to be. I would not trust such a driver. Sadly, briefly, I was almost such a bad driver myself. Um, and I recognize that the problem is just because you think you know what you need to do, you need to give the car some gas, for example. It's only when you actually do it that you really have a full understanding of what that consists of. And similarly, knowledge of Brahman amounts to the same thing. Uh, what we have to do in order to gain insight is have a real experience. Fortunately, scripture is available um, to help us do this. It's not so much that scripture provides theoretical knowledge, but it, uh, it allows us to think of things differently. It, in a way, can help us make room for this real experience to happen. Um, reason even has a place in Advaita Vedanta. But mainly what reason does is justify this approach of not expecting there to be theoretical knowledge. Um, theoretical knowledge alone just doesn't do the trick. I can assert, because I've read in a text, all is Brahman, but unless I actually feel that, uh, this really hasn't done me much good. Now the notion of Brahman is a notion that there is one supreme reality, a supreme self, and that's all there is. Again, we have a picture a little bit like one in the Sankhya system, where Purusha really doesn't have any contact with an external world. The Sankhya system claims there is such a, such a natural world, it's just not something that Purusha has anything to do with. In this picture, a monistic picture, there's not even any world out there. So in a sense, there's a kind of silence that adheres to the notion of Brahman. Um, Brahman isn't doing things external to itself. There is no external to itself. Uh, perhaps the aim spiritually is something like a kind of inner peace coming from this. That actually might be not such a bad way of thinking of what the Sankhya goal is too. If you really do detach Purusha from the wear and tear of everyday reality, that would be a peaceful thing. In this case, the peace would come about in Advaita Vedanta because we recognize that our self is part of this entire one thing, and this one thing itself is completely peaceful and self-sufficient. Now one of the challenges philosophically for um, interpreting this system is, well, what do we make of the world? After all, it seems like there's a world there. Um, even if there's some sense in which, it, which it's illusory, it doesn't seem to be an individual uh, creation. I more or less operate in the same world that other people seem to operate in. And in fact, the Upanishads themselves suggest that the world proceeds out of Brahman. Uh, Shankara himself repeats this idea by saying, as a spider spreads and withdraws its thread, so out of the immutable does the phenomenal universe arise. 
crave to know that from which all beings take birth, that from which being born they live, and that towards which they move and into which they merge. That is Brahman. So here the claim is that the world is Brahman, but also that it's been produced out of Brahman. What sense does that make if the claim is that there's only Brahman? And this whole notion of creation becomes a little bit hard to understand. Shankara's way of explaining this is to say that the world does exist, but it's not ultimately real. Now that might sound like uh, saying two things of opposite sorts at the same time. So what does he mean by this? Well, the world exists in the sense that it's not something that we can just conjure up for ourselves. Um, things within it exist relative to the picture that we all experience as the everyday world. So we can talk about things within it. Shankara claims this is like the way we talk about things in a dream. I may have dreamed last night that I was teaching a class and someone stands up and leaves the room. In the dream, it makes sense to talk about this person who stands up and leaves the room. But I'm not claiming that in the everyday world that happened. Um, my claim that that exist, existed or happened is only relative to the framework of the dream. Similarly, we can talk about the world uh, as a kind of illusion, much as a dream is, but one that has parts within it that are interrelated in certain ways. And we can certainly say things about experiences that happen within it. The question is, though, is it ultimately real? And Shankar would say no. It does have a feeling of reality about it. We have a sense that it's real. And Shankar thinks that this is a way that, in a certain distorted form, we do understand something important. Namely, that behind everyday reality is Brahman. So we have a sense that we're encountering something real, and we are. Ultimately, that's Brahman. But what we think we're encountering are just the forms and shapes that we experience in the here and now. So ordinary experience does give us something of the truth, but it also distorts, uh, distorts what we take to be true. And we don't really understand Brahman as a result. Another passage from Shankara, I think, helps to indicate how he understands this. Owing to ignorance of the rope, the rope appears to be a snake. Owing to ignorance of the self, the transient state arises of the individualized, limited, phenomenal aspects of the self. The rope becomes a rope when the false impression disappears because of the statement of some credible person. Because of the statement of my teacher, I am not an individual life monad, I am the blissful one. Okay, what Chankar is doing here is comparing the situation we have where we think that each of us is, as he puts it, an individual life monad, a separate being. Um, that, he thinks, is comparable to the optical illusion um, that one might have at a distance of thinking that a rope is actually a snake. Certainly, ropes can be coiled up in a way that resembles the way a snake can be coiled up. And I might respond to a rope as a snake until I come to see through that illusion. Now, here he's claiming that if someone who I believe tells me, oh, no, no, that's actually just a rope, I'm likely to believe that. Similarly, if we have a good spiritual teacher, we can come to recognize that what we take to be real individual selves are really just manifestations of Brahman, Brahman in certain forms. But nevertheless, we do have to see through it. And it is something that um, requires a certain amount of penetration of appearances, just as seen through an optical illusion does. Shankara also speaks of the way we can think of the connection between Brahman and the world, all these things that appear around us, as being something like the difference between reality and form. Basically, there is only one reality, Brahman. But Brahman can assume many forms. Um, similarly, we can think of the various forms that entities within this world take when we still think they're the same thing, a human being doesn't look the same as an adult as a baby, but nevertheless we say it's the same person. Shankara mentions the idea that a man who is sitting and a man who is walking has a very different form. Nevertheless, the reality is it's the same person. And he's saying that as we see different things that seem to be variable in our world, things changing, moving, distinct entities, all of these are just different forms of Brahman's manifestation. And so when we take that to be reality, 
what we're really doing is mistaking the forms for reality. So what we need to do is understand what we're perceiving correctly. And when we do understand it correctly, we have an experience like the kind of experience someone has when they suddenly see through an optical illusion. Like, ah, now I understand what was going on here. But before, I was confused and responded inappropriately. Now, because Brahman is a single reality, um, operative in everything, again, we have difficulty talking about it. And the strategy that Shankara sometimes uses is a strategy that we see in many traditions. In fact, we've already um, talked about this a bit, of talking in terms of negative characterizations rather than positive ones. What words do is make distinctions. Words are our classification tools. Uh, we learn to understand things through words because they do have particular categories that allow us to catalog different aspects of our experience um, in, in them. But the problem with understanding Brahman is no distinction we can make is really going to apply. So Shankara, like mystics in many traditions, talks in terms of what Brahman is not. An example. I am neither male nor female, nor am I sexless. I am the peaceful one whose form is self-effulgent, powerful radiance. I am neither a child, a young man, nor an ancient, nor am I of any caste. I do not belong to one of the four life stages. I am the blessed peaceful one who is the only cause of the origin and the dissolution of the world. So they are speaking in the voice of Brahman, a kind of personification of Brahman. Uh, we have this, in a sense, character with no characterization whatsoever. It's neither sex, uh, but not sexless either. Um, it's something that causes the world, but we can't say anything more about it, and actually the world conflates into it. Very clearly, the problem of dualism is not what we have here. Uh, no difficulty explaining that there is an interaction. The problem is explaining how Brahman can actually um, be connected with appearances when we don't initially see Brahman everywhere. And a further problem is suggested by that passage I just read. If Brahman is supposed to be the cause of the world, um, doesn't that mean there are actually two things, Brahman and the world? I mean, normally, when we talk about one thing being the cause of another, uh, the assumption is that they have separate identities. Our use of the word cause doesn't really make much sense. Now, occasionally, people talk about um, something that's self-caused. But even then, it usually means that a self in one state um, does something different and nothing outside that person uh, was necessary in order to bring about this change. But here we've got changeless Brahman and a world where things change, and presumably this world is supposed to have come out of Brahman. Shankara explains this in terms of causality being something that operates only within the realm of appearances. This may sound a little bit familiar in that essentially it's the same kind of move that Kant makes. When Kant talks about how it is that we come to know the world and how it is that we can trust causality, um, something that his predecessor David Hume said maybe we should worry about, Kant claims, well, causality is something that our minds bring about. Uh, we have to understand things in causal terms because that's the format that our mind is able to process them in. Uh, but strictly speaking, causality has to do with the interconnections among things in our experience. Shankara is making effectively the same claim. When we say that something is caused, strictly speaking, we're not talking about Brahman causing the world as if there were two things. Causes have to do with the interconnections between things in this world of apparent diversity. It doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about causation if there's only one thing. I mean, at least you have to consider two different um, conditions of the thing. But Brahman is eternal. Brahman doesn't change. So we can't even have Brahman causing um, a new state for Brahman. Causality is really not the right word to use for this. Manifestation is better. There's a sense in which the world simply manifests Brahman in all kinds of different forms that are interconnected. And causality is what we use to talk about how those forms interrelate. But knowledge of Brahman is not like the theoretical knowledge that we have of things, say, in science. There what we do is 
try to figure out what the causes that brought about some particular state of affairs were. If we perform an experiment, the idea is, OK, I have a theory about what causes this to occur. And if the theory is right, doing this ought to produce this effect. And I see if that works or not. But we don't have any such uh, relationship to knowledge of Brahman. Uh, we can't sort of change the conditions of Brahman to figure out um, whether the effects are as we expect. This doesn't make any sense, just given the nature of Brahman and the world. So causality has to do with our understanding of the forms of manifestation, but our knowledge of Brahman is something else. How do we come to know Brahman? Well, it's a matter of what Shankara sees as immediate knowledge. In other words, it isn't mediated by any explanation. Um, explanation can only help insofar as it helps get rid of ideas that are blocking this awareness. But Shankara thinks we do have one experience um, all the time that helps us to understand a little bit of what this experience of Brahman is like, even if we haven't yet uh, penetrated to the truth. And that's our ordinary self-awareness. Normally, when we just think of self-awareness, we kind of try to th maybe think about ourselves as a body um, or think about our behavior. But self-awareness doesn't really have a, an object in the same way that we experience objects external to us. Um, we're aware of ourselves, in a sense, without a kind of division between the subject who is aware and the object um, that which we're aware of. Um, and this subject-object dichotomy is typically the pattern of theoretical knowledge. Um, we've got an observer, ideally us, if we're the uh, investigator, and something observed. But in self-awareness, there isn't that gap. Um, we can't really get a distance from ourselves. That's one of the reasons why it's hard to know yourself in Socrates' sense, simply because it is hard to get any distance, um, psychologically or otherwise, from ourselves. And when we recognize what it's like to be self-aware, Shankar is saying that already is brought about because of Brahman. This kind of immediate manifestation of self that we're just aware of is like the understanding of Brahman. And if we can just extend that to the rest of reality, uh, recognizing Brahman is the precondition of all the rest of it, um, then we can have that kind of direct experience. Again, just saying that doesn't bring the experience about. But Shankara thinks that these various theoretical things he's claiming help clear away some of the ideas that interfere with this possible uh, realization. Now, Advaita Vedanta um, talks in terms of Brahman, but it doesn't explicitly talk in terms of God. And there's a big debate in Indian thought about whether or not Brahman should be identified with God. Um, the argument for identifying Brahman with God, I suppose, is fairly obvious that usually what people mean by God is the absolute, um, the almighty, certainly characteristics, insofar as you can characterize Brahman at all, that we would use to uh, give us some idea of what Brahman is about. It's the question of the personality of God that becomes problematic for some thinkers in Indian um, philosophy. Whether or not you can really say that this supreme force of the universe is a person in anything like what we mean by person, and that's always going to be modeled on human beings, is a real question. Now, some schools of thought, unlike Advaita Vedanta, do explicitly talk in terms of God, where God and Brahman are identified. And the idea here is that maybe these personifications are anthropomorphic. I mean, maybe they sort of take over certain aspects of human psychology and our characteristics to help us understand God. But it's nevertheless Brahman that's really being experienced here. Um, and we can relate much better to a notion of Brahman if personified. Now, usually, theistic schools of Indian thought um, are grounded in the text, the Bhagavad Gita, which we'll be talking about in the next lecture. Um, that text combines features that we actually see in both Samkhya and Advaita Vedanta. Um, it's an interesting synthesis of various schools of Indian thought. But what makes it relevant in this context is that the notion of a supreme god, there being a single um, god within the universe, um, and that being the same as Brahman, is suggested very explicitly um, in that whole discussion. Um, Krishna, a manifestation of God, um, describes himself as the whole universe. 
and that's something that um, we need to go into uh, when we discuss that more precisely. But at any rate, the idea is that there's a notion of focusing on an individual personification of Brahman and that being more or less equivalent to other cultures' notion of God and this being the best way that human beings can relate to this otherwise pretty abstract idea. When Brahman is understood um, in sort of personal terms as God, the term used is Ishvara. Um, so if we talk about Ishvara, um, Ishvara is Brahman, but given a kind of personalized um, character as, as this principle is understood in these theistic systems. When we have a theistic system in Indian thought, then there's a kind of um, odd equation that goes on between the self and God. Indeed, many mystical traditions um, other, outside of India have the same kind of oddity. If the goal of mysticism is to become one with God, well, there's one sense in which you can say that you're God, but most religious traditions don't really like that very much because they're afraid that it's, it's too much a suggestion that the individual that we usually take to be ourselves is God, that it's a kind of inflation of your private egoistic self into the supreme principle of the world. But uh, the, these Indian theistic schools acknowledge, well, there's one sense in which it's true to say that you're God. Um, if you understand the individual self that we usually take seriously as being an illusion, then it's God manifests completely within you, just as within everything else. So we have to understand properly what the relationship between God and the individual is. But ultimately, there's only God. So you manifest God. Other beings manifest God. Um, everything that appears in the, in the world are just forms of God, in a sense, interacting with himself. A feature of theism that is important for understanding the Bhagavad Gita is that these traditions believe in the notion of gods becoming manifest in particular human beings. Um, this is the concept of avatars, or avatara. Um, and the idea here is that from time to time, um, God takes a form of being born as a person. And this is inevitably in a situation where human beings really need help. They need divine intervention. But rather than operating from on high, um, I guess the tradition of miracles in the West would be um, that kind of example, what we have here is perhaps a little bit more like the Christian interpretation of Christ, that God literally becomes a human being and intervenes in human affairs from a human point of view. And that's what we'll find um, is happening in the Bhagavad Gita. God is manifest as a character, Krishna, though Krishna is the name of a god. Um, and this is a manifestation of a particular god in the Indian pantheon called Vishnu. Vishnu, be, Vishnu being the god that supports creation, um, keeps creation going. Um, and we'll find that in this particular account within the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is active. He's actually participating in a war. But even though he has a particular personal role, his true nature is that of God and God intervening in the affairs of human beings from a human point of view. Now, even though where we're going to continue is going to be talking more about these theistic notions of Brahman and God generally, I should also point out that there are other schools of Indian thought that are not theistic at all. Uh, one of the most noteworthy ones is the Karvaka school. And it takes the fairly unusual position in Indian thought that jiva is actually um, the whole thing, that basically we are individuals and we are mortal. So the view that the individual self comes to an end with death, that other schools buy, is right according to the Korvaka system. It's just that it's not right to say that our self is anything other than that. So as things appear, it seems that human beings are around for a while and then they die. The Karvaka school claims that's absolutely right. And not surprisingly, there is a kind of insinuation here that anything that's going to happen with you better happen in this life. Um, in the West, we sometimes say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. That's not so far from the Karvaka viewpoint. Uh, needless to say, the more theistic and Brahmanic schools have lots to say to criticize that. There are also some schools of Indian thought that tend to have more secular concerns than 
inner knowledge and the relationship of the human soul to Brahman. Um, for example, just the idea of knowing things in a kind of practical sense becomes a really important topic for various schools, such as the Nyaya school, a school of realists. We'll say a bit more about them later on. For now, though, we're going to turn to the Bhagavad Gita, which is probably the supreme statement of Brahmanism and ethical thought in particular as the Indian tradition has developed it. <laughs> 